I just want to say thank you for letting me be here. And I tell you, it's a really impressive day when you hear the talks that have been on. So hopefully I can live up to that. Now, I changed my title to Disease Care to Health Care, and I didn't do this actually to be political. Uh, I actually did this for, for a purpose. So how many of you have been to the doctor this year because you're healthy? <laughs> a couple. How did you get reimbursed for that, by the way? I'm just curious. And so, by the way, I just want you to think about this for a moment. So healthcare in America, I don't know how many, how many of you know this. We talk about how expensive it is. Do you know how expensive it really is? It is the world's fifth largest economy, okay? It is larger than France's entire economy as our healthcare economy. In fact, it's not healthcare at all. It's disease care. Why do I say that? Well, it's based on you being sick. It's not about you being healthy at all. And it's also runs on averages. And I'm going to spend a good part of my talk talking about averages and what does that mean. So here's Shaq O'Neal and Danica Patrick. And so what do I mean that healthcare runs on averages? Well, here's a simple, silly example that hopefully you'll remember. They both have a headache. They're both adults. And the directions say, adults take two aspirin. <laughs> Why are you laughing? That's what the directions say. Well, you're laughing because you can see Shaq O'Neal should probably take four, and Danica Patrick should probably take one. Well, if you can't see that difference, which your doctor can't, how many would you take? You'd take two. And I'm just simply saying in 2015, I think we can do a better job of that. Because your DNA actually is your blueprint. It actually has the ability. Every single cell in your body is able to tell something about who you are and what medicines you should take. In fact, these two individuals are 99.9% .9 identical to each other. They only differ at 4 million data points out of 6 billion. That's incredibly similar, 99.9%. .9 and your doctor has no blueprint. Why can't we use this as a blueprint? Well, how we think of DNA. We all think it's kind of cute. You've probably all asked yourself this question, how Neanderthal am I? Because, uh, by the way, you are Neanderthal. You're between 2 and 7%. Look at your neighbor across the brow. You know how much they are. <laughs> we think about really exciting things like where do we come from. This is actually where, my, where I come from. Uh, Clearly, from looking at my DNA, there's been two affairs in the family that no one knows about. There's Irish blood and Spanish blood in there. In fact, nobody knows about that. I am 100% German. <laughs> Apparently not. So where does this come from? That's how we think about our DNA. And we ask really important questions about DNA. Was there an Adam and an Eve? Well, what do you think? Well, it depends on your religious beliefs. I understand that. But science should be able to test that, right? So it turns out that, indeed, mitochondrial Eve lived 140,000 years ago. This is a fact, despite the fact it's from Wikipedia. <laughs> because mitochondria is a little cell piece, is a little part of DNA in your cell, and every single one of you comes from this exact woman. That's a fact. How about for men? Where would you figure out for Adam? Well, it turns out that the Y chromosome is what makes us men. So actually, Adam lived 60,000 years ago. Anybody see a problem with that? Well, there's at least two problems, right? One is that Adam, came, Adam didn't come first, Eve did. And second of all, there's 80,000 years between them. Now, I'm not one that has this feeling, but some people in this audience would say those are the best 80,000 years of Eve's life. <laughs> so with this information, I think we can actually do a better job. So here's a little bit about DNA. So DNA, you get 46 chromosomes, 23 from mom, 23 from dad. The DNA in every cell in your body is two meters long. That's about as tall as I am. It carries about 30,000 genes and 6 billion data points. You glue that end to end, it's 666.5 round trips to the sun and back. You are one big data problem for your doctor. And your doctor has no blueprint to deal with that big data problem. And my job and my team's job is really easy. Can we figure out if there's anything wrong in 666.5 round trips to the sun and back? Because one single change can kill you. That's called cancer. So how do you deal with this? So the Human Genome Project in 2002, after 10 years, it cost a billion dollars. In 2004, the rat genome was, was sequenced, and it cost, took only two years and 100 million. And at that point in time, I stood up in front of the executive faculty at my previous institution. I said, by 2014, we're going to have this in the clinic. Now, some would say that that was stupid. Some would say that was dreaming. Some would say that was both. How in the world are you going to get from $100 million down to having this in the clinic by 2014? 2010, we saved the first child, 
at a cost of about $250,000 with total costs that went into this. And I'm just gonna say, standing up here, all you need right now is an app for that. Now it might sound kind of funny, but I'm standing up here with an iPad for a reason. So, you wanna see my genome? I know it sounds like a genome scientist pickup line, but seriously, I'm gonna show you this. <coughs> So I'm gonna show you my genome, in theory. So this is my genome. And we can go in and we can take a look at it. And we can interpret my genome, and I've got a bunch of diseases on here. And you might think, well, doesn't that make you nervous? Well, most of these doesn't make me nervous because I'd have to have two copies for it to kill me, right? There's this one right here that's kind of interesting. It's hyperinsulinemia, which basically means I'm susceptible for diabetes. Not a surprise, most of us are. But it turns out that for me, it's a little bit unusual because I'm the only person on the planet that has this particular mutation. It causes it to stop. So if I was normal, you'd have a whole bunch of colored bars come up there, and we can drill in and we can look at that individual one. And I have a T, and I'm supposed to have a C. That's the only thing that's different when I'm showing you. Everything else is identical. So that simple change means that when I exercise a lot, I get lightheaded. That doesn't sound very serious to you, but if I'm riding my bike going 40 miles an hour down Montesano, which was I was doing the other day, that's kind of fast. If I get lightheaded and fall off, that could be detrimental, right? So if I just simply do a Gatorade, I'm fine. Okay, so that's cute, not very exciting. It's a little bit better than being a Neanderthal. But there's other things that you can do in terms of thinking about your genome. So what other things could I do with my genome sitting right here? Well, it turns out that my mom had breast cancer She's a survivor. My grandmother had breast cancer. She's a survivor. I have a 21-year-old daughter and an 18-year-old daughter. You've heard of the Angelina Jolie genes, BRCA1, BRCA2. Most of you have probably heard about that. You may have heard about the program we're running at Hudson Alpha called uh, Knowledge is Power, where we're going to be helping women uh, look for these breast cancer genes if you're 30 years old. So should we look? How many of you think I should show, type in right now breast cancer and look up that gene? How many think I should do that because of my daughters? How many of you think I shouldn't? How many think I should ask my daughters first? Oh, you didn't think about that when you raised your hand the first time, did you, right? Because it's not just my genome, right? That's why I call this personalized medicine. So if we then go in and we type in breast cancer, I have a mutation in BRCA2. What does that mean? Well, so we can drill right in and look at that. So you see all those bars that comes up? Almost everybody has that same mutation if you're Caucasian. So it's not really a concern. I don't have to worry about it, right? So I should feel good. My daughters don't have to worry about breast cancer, right? Or not, right? Well, what if we drill into this and look a little bit more into this gene? So it turns out that we can go in and look at this. So this gene, the BRCA2, is this gene that I just expanded. You see all those different colored lines? Well, hopefully you can see them. The color's not very good. But those different striped lines are all variations in my genome that could cause disease. We just simply don't know what they are. So, but we can go back and we can ask some other questions about this. So we only, we only know that I'm safe from those genes. We don't know if these cause disease. But, and the insurance companies will say, is that really, should we pay for that? Well, what if we then ask about drugs? So what if I have a gene for a specific drug? And we do a little search on this thing and look to see if I have any variation. Because not only could we look up for breast cancer, but we can look up for any drug that I have, that I take. In fact, I do this. I look on my iPad every single time I take a new medication to find out because, believe it or not, drugs are the number 10, it's searching a trillion data points. Um, drugs come up with are the number 10 killer in the US, and I'm not talking the illegal ones. I'm talking the ones that are, on average, safe to you. So it turns out that I have a G instead of an A. So if we go into a database, and I'm going to do this, I'm not going to do it live. You could do it live. You can go to this little database called Farm GKB. I've actually already loaded this up. But I can go online, and I can do this. And what I can do is type in breast cancer and go in and take a look. So tamoxifen, which is a drug that my mom took and probably saved her life, she's probably a GG. I'm a GA. And if you could read up there, it would tell you that I have an increased ra risk of disease occurring because I have that genotype instead of a GG. It also says some other things. So this particular mutation affects 
115 drugs that I can take. And there's a couple of them up there for cancer, heart disease, cholesterol drugs, antibiotics, and aspirin. I wish it could tie in really well with that Shaq O'Neal story, but no, my mutation's fine for aspirin. But people say that this is experimental. It's not really important. And I'm going to say that I think we should think about this differently. And so this is actually from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama. And it says that, as a general uh, rule, benefits are payable under Blue Cross Blue Shield of Alabama Health only causes medical necessity only if services or supplies are not investigational, provided the customer group contracts such coverage. Down below, technology must have final approval, and there must be evidence. So how do you do evidence on an N01? How do you do a clinical trial on me? How many more people do we have to sequence before we figure this out? I'm going to say we could get started right now. Because this is how we really practice medicine. This is Nick Volker at 2. This is Nick Volker at 4. After he's been being treated for two years, and we don't know what's wrong with him, and Nick is dying. He hasn't eaten for nine months, and we're paying for all of that. We went in and read his genome, figured out what was wrong with him. And this is Nick 42 days after a core blood transplant, which cured a gut disease. No one had ever done that before. Where do you get that information? Are you kidding me? We're not going to pay for this insurance-wise? Are you kidding me? Here's Nick at 10. He's going to be 11 next month. I'm going to say we should pay for this, okay? And if you want to read this story, one in a billion. Now, when we did this, that's great. I keep hitting this with my thumb. When we did this, the, the authors of this, uh, Kathleen Gallagher and Mark Johnson, are writing a book on this. And they've interviewed my team a bunch of times. And they keep asking, weren't you brave to do this? It's a risk. What if you had failed? Are you kidding me? Look at Nick at four. How can we not do this, okay? So this is, a, this is a goal that we all set forth on, and we've quite successful. We've now looked at over 500 children, and we've helped a lot of them, and I feel really good about that, except for one little big problem. About 5% of Americans have an undiagnosed disease. I've talked to two in this audience today. You don't hear about them. Why aren't we helping these people? There's 20 million people that need this. I'm going to say we should do a better job around this. I'm also going to say that here's all the hospitals in the United States. Five do this. Five. Okay? This happens to be Alabama, my new home. That little cluster of dots up at the top there, you all know your geography better than me. That's Huntsville. November 1, the first genomics medicine clinic in the world is going to open at Hudson Alpha. So. I'm going to finish with, let's change medicine. Ask your company to find an insurer that will cover genome sequencing now. Guess what? We're the policyholders. If you don't demand it, they're not going to give it. Number two, let's make Madison County the first county in the world where we sequence all the genomes. Now, I don't know how we're going to do that. It's not cheap, but let's figure that out. Information is power is our first step in this process. And your genome benefits you your family and society, let's use that. Now, I wanted to finish with a quote, because people have said I'm a dreamer. My wife will tell you that, Lisa. People say I'm a risk taker, um, because I do things like let's sequence this kid when we don't know what's wrong with him. But that's not how I view myself at all. I'm going to tell you what I live by right here. It's a quote from Theodore Roosevelt. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who actually is in the arena, whose face is marred by dust, sweat, and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcomings, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who is at best knows the end, the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold, timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Let's change medicine. Thank you for your attention.